My name is Dan Roydesar. I'm a uh, medical officer uh, over the water in the Institute of Naval Medicine, uh, where we've got a, uh, an applied physiology lab. And for the last 15 years, I have been responsible for investigating military personnel who've suffered from uh, exertional heat illness and the most severe form of exertional heat stroke. So most of my patients have been extremely unwell. Uh, and what I'm charged with doing is, is trying to uh, make sure that they're occupationally fit and well enough to go back to thermally demanding occupations. And it's, it's quite a challenge because there's an awful lot that we don't know and it's uh, very difficult to try and take somebody who's been uh, very ill as a consequence of hypothermia and subject them to exercise testing where we're deliberately trying to make them hypothermic. Now, exertional heat illness itself is it's quite a complex disorder uh, and it's characterized by the inability to thermoregulate during uh, physical activity. Within uh, sporting, the sporting world, it's one of the most frequent causes of sudden death in, in, in young athletes. It's a particular occupational hazard for the military. And, and, and predominantly, this is what I don't want to see. This is very bad for my employer. It tends to be all over the, all over the, uh, the national newspapers and the inquiries and the inquests and the work to go and, and, and investigate this goes on for many years afterwards. It's incredibly costly for you as the taxpayer. What we would understand is that there is this spectrum of, of what is probably normal uh, physiological response to extreme exercise and the environment through to a, a descent towards uh, pathophysiology and a descent towards illness. Now, the majority of my patients come from the, the, the severe heat exhaustion, heat stroke uh, end of this spectrum, and it's predominantly exertional heat illness. Now, anyone can, it, can suffer from uh, exertional heat stroke uh, if they're subjected to sufficient uh, uh, heat stress. And we all know about the various environmental and physical factors that will lower heat tolerance, principally by impairing heat dissipation. Now, around the world, there is consensus that some individuals may have a genetic predisposition to exertional heat illness, but there's limited data to, to uh, confirm whether there are involvement of, spe of specific genes or even an underlying genetic model. Now, acutely with heat stroke, almost every, every patient that suffers from this will uh, present with profound CNS dysfunction, central nervous system dysfunction. It's one of the major diagnostic criteria. There's a loss of higher cortical functioning. There's, uh, and we'll come back to that later with some of the, the knock-on problems that patients develop. There is a uh, loss of coordination from the cere cerebellar dysfunction. People are ataxic, dysarthric. They're stumbling around, falling all over the place. Patients often complain of, of gastrointestinal dysfunction. There's thermal hypopnea, and the descent is through uh, uh, cardiovascular shock and collapse. And this all happens in the acute phase. So as temperature rises uh, above a, a, a threshold, and uh, I don't necessarily believe that there is a, 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 an absolute temperature threshold for every individual. Um, some people will tolerate core temperatures that are far higher than I may be able to cope with, depending on whether they're in a compensable or uncompensable dress, uh, dress state or environment. But what happens is you get an increase in, in iron flux, uh, transmembrane iron fluxes, rate of protein synthesis is inhibited, and severe hypothermia is going to act on peripheral thermoreceptors and central thermoreceptors to increase hypothalamic in, or the inputs into the hypothalamus with the, out, the output of an increased stroke volume, profound increases in heart rate, uh, increases in, in skin blood flow, and sweating will eventually uh, lead to a profound sense of thirst as plasma osmolality arises above that thirst, that, that, uh, thirst threshold. Eventually, there's a decrease in plasma volume, an increase in, in hematocrit, blood viscosity uh, increases, uh, and this has a knock-on consequence with myocardial work. Ultimately, what then eventually happens is you end up in this positive feedback loop where you have a, a, an increasing uh, deep core temperature, uh, uh, and eventually the uh, core temperature rate of rise will lead to a level where you end up with circulatory uh, failure and skin blood flow falls, temperature rises even, even further. And for the individual that that is happening to, the, the outcome is catastrophic or potentially catastrophic. Uh, 
all the tissues are, have a, a, a lot of swelling. There's degeneration of the tissues and, and cellular structures and organelles. Pathological samples and post-mortem samples on non-survivors show widespread microscopic and macroscopic uh, hemorrhages, and, their organ, and the organs are congested with, with swollen, damaged, uh, damaged cells. These are very complex pathways, and it's more than there being uh, two pathways as illustrated on this side. And we don't, know, we don't really know whether uh, it is one or two pathways uh, being activated independently or activating together uh, that go to cause uh, tissue damage. Certainly, if you get tissues heated up to very high temperatures, you're going to get the direct heating damage to the, the, the tissue structures. But that model doesn't explain the inconsistency of very, very high temperatures in giving us non-survivors or patients who end up in intensive care who probably get uh, their pathophysiological uh, outcomes from this, uh, the inflammatory response model. And what we're talking about here is probably related to gut uh, dysfunction and the uh, interleukins and inflammatory uh, molecules that are released as a consequence. Now, hypothermia shares a, a, and high heat stroke shares a, a, a lot of similarities with septicemia. During exercise, during uh, profound heat stress, people will uh, experience some degree of gastrointestinal dysfunction, and there's a reduction in, in splanchnic perfusion. If they can recall what's going on, and many of my patients have very little memory of the later stages of their illness, they give us a, a history of uh, gut distress, being unable to tolerate drinking, having um, essentially episodes of diarrhea. And this actually then uh, gives them the inability to correct for fluid losses and the electrolyte losses that we would normally expect to, uh, to uh, correct for the, the, the effects of the hypothermia. The high temperature and the, and the re reduction in, uh, in blood flow, reduc reduction in splanchnic perfusion, injure the intestinal wall, and the injury to the intestinal wall is probably the, the trigger for uh, the worst case scenario with heat stroke, heat stroke patients. What happens is you, you've compromised the, uh, the, the gut lumen, and the, the, the compromised gut is unable to prevent translocation of a polysaccharide, lipopolysaccharide, also known as endotoxin. It's a component of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, and this stuff can leak across into the portal vein and then into the, into the systemic circulation. There are measures that we have to, to deal with, with this stuff leaking into the system, but under the, the scenario of, of, of heat stroke uh, and heat illness, you can uh, overwhelm the system. It's a highly toxic, uh, toxic molecule. And what we know from animal studies, and there's a pretty good review um, from uh, Lim and Mackinnon, is that uh, lipopolysaccharide increases the risk of heat stroke in animal models, and anti-lipopolysaccharide treatment actually improves the survival. Now, what does lipopolysaccharide do? It binds to a blood component, lipopolysaccharide binding protein, and this complex then binds to the cluster of differentiation 14 uh, receptor on macrophages and other cell types that then goes on to induce a whole load of uh, uh, changes resulting in inflammatory uh, cytokines uh, and interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, and amongst others, being released. And these then go on to injure cells. The effects of, of sepsis on cytokine expression shows these, uh, shows these molecules being released at quite, quite uh, large amounts, and you get a similar picture with, with heat, stroke, uh, heat stroke patients. What tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1 do is they bind to membrane receptors, uh, uh, inducing the formation of, of phospholipase A2. And this then has a, uh, has a, a, a through another set of, sort of on, quite complex pathways, increases the production of toxic leukotrienes, thromboxanes and prostaglandins, mainly leukotriene B, B4 and D4, uh, and prostaglandin D2 and E2. These uh, agents, in somebody who's already experiencing quite profound cardiovascular shock, may tend take somebody from a potentially recoverable clinical scenario to something that is, 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 is fatal. For example, the, 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 the leukotrienes, uh, 
actually increase capillary cell leakage, they're vasoconstrictors, and, and they cause bronchospasm. So these, these uh, agents in sick patients are bad news. Now in the acute phase, we see almost every single one of our patients uh, gets a, a huge white cell response. There's a huge leuco leukocytosis. They very often have some degree of clotting at disturbance because uh, the uh, components are, of the blood clotting cascade are also activated in a, in a, similar, a similar pathway. And you high, have high levels of various cellular enzymes being, produ being produced. If you get to these, pe these people and cool them down, which is the life-saving goal, uh, goal of first aid, their CNS function, their cortical functioning will respond very rapidly. Cardiovascular function comes back within a couple of hours, but what we then see is that hepatic and renal function can, uh, can be uh, impaired for quite some days afterwards. And rhabdomolysis, skeletal muscle breakdown can complicate the picture. Is hepatic injury common in these, in these patients? Well, yes, it is. It's a, it happens in about one in seven of the patients who come through our clinic. And what we're looking at here is a, is, is a patient who has, to all intents and purposes, to the, the emergency room treating physician, they look like they have improved, they're back, they feel absolutely fine. And yet if you then measure their serum biochemistry in the days afterwards, you'll find that a lot of them have evidence of hepatic, uh, uh, hepatic involvement. And it can take uh, several days, if not several weeks to settle down. Lisa Leon did, uh, has done some, uh, and her team did some uh, pretty good work on this look with Fisher rats. So we've got an animal model to investigate this. Now, as a, as a clinician, what I want to know is when can I return my person back to exercise? When is it safe to do so? What this, this, uh, this work does, uh, we have a controlled animal on the, on the left of your screen. We have an, a, an animal that had heat stroke and uh, uh, quite profound uh, blood urea, nitrogen, and uh, hepatic markers. Well, these animals are then then euthanized at uh, 10 days. And what the slide shows is, is that you've got evidence of both microscopic and macroscopic damage to the kidney and the liver. In animals in which the blood markers have returned back to normal levels at 10 days, actually there's still persisting evidence of, of, of microscopic and macroscopic damage to these tissues. So the clinical tests that we use probably aren't adequate in, in measuring the degree of tissue damage. Now the other problem we have is exertional heat illness actually shares a, a substantial clinical overlap with, um, with a condition called malignant hypothermia. This is a condition that plagues uh, an, uh, anaesthetists, whereby you give a, a, a patient a, a particular anaesthetic agent, they lose control of calcium handling, they become hypothermic on the anaesthetic table and the outcome generally is pretty poor. Now our colleagues who we're doing some work with started to pose the question of whether there was a link between malignant hypothermia and exertional heat illness in this article in 2007. And what we're talking about here is a, is a, is a disorder of calcium handling in these patients related to this particular protein complex, the ranadine receptor uh, uh, complex that is linked to the, uh, the T-tubule and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now for patients with malignant hypothermia from the anaesthetic world, we investigate them by both DNA screening, but you can't pick up every single mutation. All of these individuals end up having quite a, quite a nasty, hefty uh, uh, muscle biopsy for an in vitro contraction test to look for abnormal contraction of skeletal muscle. We've taken this further by looking at uh, a, a gene expression in, uh, in a group of uh, malignant hypothermic, known malignant hypothermic susceptible uh, pa patients who've never had exertional heat illness, exertional heat illness patients and controls. And what we do is we, all of our patients do a, a, a exercise test where they are they're deliberately exercised for up to 90 minutes in a heat chamber following a VO2 max assessment and, and, a, uh, and a medical. And what we found with this, with, with this particular pilot study, having looking at a whole load of genes, far too many really, um, that there were between the, the heat intolerant and the heat tolerant individuals, didn't matter whether you were from the MH group or the, uh, the exertional heat stroke group, that there were 40 genes that were profoundly differentially expressed, and most of these were from metabolic and inflammatory processes. So it's taken that further to then do with the colleagues at, uh, at Leeds Hospital, 
to do some sequencing on a cohort of survivors of exertional heat illness. And what we found with in the exertional heat illness cohort of this particular bit of work, that there were some novel variants in the ryanodine receptor. So there, there are probably some, uh, some, some variations and also within some of the calcium handling genes. Taking that a little bit further, this particular bit of work is currently under editorial review. It's been submitted to a journal of, 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 of genetics. With what we've got here are 64 patients who've had exertional heat illness, exertional rhabdomyolysis, or both. Now, 59 of them are my patients who have demonstrated um, and, be, uh, and have eventually been referred because they have all been seriously ill. 53 of those patients have been through our clinic on multiple occasions because and they have demonstrated exertional, persistent exertional heat intolerance. And there were a handful who managed to eventually pass the heat tolerance assessment. They were all heat intolerant at the first clinic attendance. Some of them recovered and did reasonably well, but they all went in. 11 of these individuals had severe complications at the time of presentation. Okay, so severe, multi-organ failure, people ending up in intensive care for many, many days, um, clotting disturbances, seizures, and, and even two cardiac arrests. Okay, so they're, they're very lucky to survive. And we've then taken them and tried to make them deliberately hypothermic in our clinic. Of this particular group, the, the, the standard clinical diagnosis for MH would have picked out um, abnormal uh, muscle biopsy results in about 35% of them. And they, they, they were uh, statistically more likely to have a, a ryanodine receptor uh, gene uh, variation. But we also identified 51 non-synonymous variants annotated as pathogenic in 42 patients. And these go through a whole load of different, different genes. So the, the, but essentially, what we're looking at here is a, we found 15 rare but probably pathogenic um, variations in, in ryanodine receptor uh, areas or the, um, the, the CAV 1.1, which is the, the ca other calcium handling uh, 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 genes. But the most interesting bit for me is that there are a whole load of other myopathies or potential myopathies that are, that are picked up in, uh, and we've identified in this. So three of, the, three of this particular cohort, this is not a, this table doesn't um, have the, whole, the entire list, have me had uh, uh, mutations in the, the PYGM gene. This is myophosphorylase. People with a, a, a mutation in this are likely to have uh, McArdle syndrome, exercise intolerance. AMPD1 uh, and uh, ATP21A, Brody's myopathy. CLCN1, another myopathy. These are, the, these are skeletal muscle myopathies that one would normally associate with exercise intolerance, and yet the, the patients are presenting with exertional heat stroke during exercise. We think this is novel evidence for, for um, some heterozygous variants in genes which encode for enzymes that have a role in maintaining oxidative phosphorylation and genes associated with regulation of skeletal muscle membrane being implicated in some cases of exertional heat illness and exertional rhabdomyolysis. Now, not all of our patients are, have problems with, with, with uh, muscle physiology. But what we have noticed is that during the heat tolerance assessment, some of them, when you are heat intolerant, but they look really unwell when they're doing the assessment. They're really pale. They're very, very shut down. They appear to be um, uh, almost uh, under the, 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 the sort of a sympathetic drive, and they look dreadful, rather like sort of patients having angina would look pale and sweaty and, and, and look very well, unwell. This pilot work um, was done by a colleague of mine, Major Mike Stacey, who uh, is up at Imperial College. And what he did is he took, he looked at markers of sympathoadrenal uh, uh, markers of uh, uh, patients, 16 patients going through, the, going through the clinic at various time points, post the VO2 max test and then post heat tolerance test. Uh, what he actually identified was that there appears to be um, a particular difference in those who are heat tolerant versus heat intolerant. I think it, it, it's not, enough to draw major conclusions from, but something that we need to go and have a, have a look at further. Now, while we're all worrying as occupational physicians about returning people back to normal physiology and their return to play or their return to thermally demanding occupation, I then have to go back to 
what about the long-term neurological deficits following heat stroke? Because I told you that the, 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 the main presentational feature is profound CNS dysfunction. A lot of our patients <coughs> complain of some form of cognitive impairment that is, li that is lifelong. They complain of, or their spouses, or their work colleagues complain of them having personality <coughs> changes. People being slightly more irritable. They're not so good around the house. And um, the following data uh, comes from um, patients up at uh, Stanford Hall, which is the Defense National Rehabilitation Center. These are our patients who are referred uh, for neurocognitive rehab and assessment. Now, acutely, CNS dysfunction, cerebellar dysfunction, we have ataxia coordination type problems, dysarthria. We have higher cortical functioning problems with, in, from the, uh, the, the, the main cerebrum, things like memory loss. Most of that tends to recover. Uh, we then have um, problems probably coming from the brainstem. And I'm gonna show you some, some, some psychological uh, cognitive testing on, on our patients. So one pa first patient collapsed in a, doing a, a speed march in December, actually on a very, very cold day, collapsed near the finish line, hypothermic, has absolutely no recall of, of most of that um, fitness test or the, the, the period of time afterwards. But going back into the history, his family members and he had some degree of gastrointestinal um, illness in the run-up to that that probably accounted for him having a problem. He failed our heat tolerance assessment repeatedly. And over the course of time, talking to his, his wife, she said he'd had problems with um, his, uh, with his memory, problems with um, anger and various other things. We referred him up to Stanford Hall, and, and what they do is they do a whole battery of neurocognitive tests. And this is only one of them. This is a, a Mayo Portland plot for this particular patient. And what you can see on here is that he's got problems with communication, attention, memory, problems with leisure, social contact, and various other things. Have another patient, a Royal Marine, two episodes of heat illness. The first time he's completely cleared, not complaining of any problems, but between our first appointment when we saw him and subsequently he's starting to complain of nervous, t of having um, tics and various other things that are developing. And then he had a second episode in, in 2015 associated with a minor head injury as he hit the deck. At this point, his cognitive functioning went, deteriorated a lot worse once he'd recovered from this. And his Mayo Portland plot shows a whole load of very similar pattern here, with problems with attention, memory, and concentration, social le leisure interaction, and depressingly, a lot of problem here with, with, with uh, anger management, irritability, uh, and, uh, the, and those sort of things. Third patient, slightly sicker, into intensive care, Glasgow Coma score of three out of 15, so this person is, 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 a lucky, is lucky to survive and we have the same pattern evolving. Now, what I'm getting at here is that all, with all of these individuals that go through um, the neurocognitive rehab, all of their neuroimaging is absolutely barn door normal. And yet they still have profound problems, particularly in this area. What's the importance of that? This is brainstem functioning. This is, this is the control for these areas of, of, of your, co your cognitive behavior are coming from your brainstem. So the, we are probably seeing a knock-on effect in terms of uh, injury to the, to the brainstem from that original heat stroke episode. So just to summarize, heat illness pathophysiology is complex. It shares many similarities with sepsis. And although anyone can suffer from uh, exertional heat illness under the right circumstances, there is this group of patients who might very well have a genetic predisposition towards the condition. Both organ pathology and heat intolerance can persist long after what seems like a normal physiological recovery. And there's a, there's a, a whole load of further work that needs to, be do, needs to be done to understand when it is safe to return people, athletes, military personnel, people who work in construction back to, therm you know, firefighters and the like, back to thermally demanding occupations. And whilst everyone's worrying about the, phys the return of phys normal physiological function, going back to normal, there's this hidden enemy in the room. And that most, uh, a lot of patients seem to have long-term psychophysiological problems that go unrecognized by us as clinicians and actually have major impact and probably the largest impact on their, uh, their quality of life and their, family, their family's quality of life. So 
I presented a lot of work. I have a lot of, 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 of co-workers who deserve a mention and various institutions who deserve a mention uh, and pr primarily probably the largest cohort of patients who've gone through our clinics. Thank you.